I was an active member of the Reddit community, browsing subreddits and engaging in discussions on a daily basis. One evening, as I scrolled through a popular thread, I stumbled upon a comment that caught my attention. It was a seemingly innocent remark about a topic I had recently posted about. Intrigued, I clicked on the username to view their profile. What I discovered was unnerving. The user had a long history of comments, all directed at me. It was as if they had been following my every move on Reddit, monitoring my posts and comments with an unsettling level of detail. Their messages ranged from compliments about my insights to personal observations about my life outside of Reddit. Feeling a chill creep up my spine, I quickly closed the tab and tried to brush off the encounter as just a bizarre coincidence. But as the days passed, I just couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Every comment I made, every post I created, I had a lingering fear that the Reddit stalker was hovering over my virtual shoulder, silently observing my every move. As time went on, the stalker's messages grew bolder. They began to reference things that I had never shared publicly, intimate details about my personal life that were only known to me. Panic set in, as I realized that this person had somehow infiltrated my online presence, tearing down the walls of anonymity that I had come to rely on. I decided to take action. I contacted the Reddit administrators, sharing screenshots of the stalker's messages and pleading for help. They assured me that they would investigate the matter, but the stalker remained elusive, leaving no traceable information behind. It seemed that they were always one step ahead, effortlessly slipping through the virtual cracks. Paranoia consumed me. I started second-guessing every interaction I had on Reddit, wondering if the person I was engaging with was the stalker in disguise. Sleep became a distant memory, as my mind raced with the possibilities of who this person might be and what their intentions were. Days turned into weeks, and the torment continued. But just as I was on the brink of giving up, an unexpected breakthrough then occurred. The Redditor's administrators had reached out to inform me that they had traced the stalker's IP address to an unknown location. With newfound hope, I collaborated with the administrators to gather evidence and also involve law enforcement. It was a race against time to unmask the person behind the screen and to put an end to the terror they had inflicted upon my life. Finally, after weeks of tireless investigation, the authorities were finally able to apprehend the stalker. As it turned out, it was someone I had crossed paths with only briefly in real life, a face I had long forgotten. Their obsession with me had driven them to obsessively track my every move on Reddit, a twisted digital manifestation of their warped desires. This ordeal left me scarred, forever changed. It was a chilling reminder of the dark side of the internet, where anonymity can be weaponized and boundaries can be shattered with the click of a button. The Reddit stalker taught me to guard my online presence zealously, to be cautious of the strangers lurking in the shadows of the virtual world. I'm 24 now, but at the time of the story, I was 15 years old. I had just started milking the cows on my family's dairy farm to get some extra money to afford my first vehicle. I had been working there for almost two months at the time of this, and I drove to the farm like usual. Yes, I drove without a license, but it was only three miles, so what? I stepped out of the car, and the whole place seemed quiet. A little too quiet. I took a 360 view just to observe my surroundings. I walked into the barn, and I started getting the cows into the milking part. About halfway through, I heard a loud boom like something fell in the area right above me. To really get a feel for the layout of this barn, there's a lower level where the milking area is located at. There's also calf pens on the lower level in a separate area. The higher area has a wooden floor, and you can hear every sound, even small animals walking around. I had assumed that the noise was nothing, 
and sort of just shrugged it off as my mind playing tricks on me or something. About 15 minutes later, I heard the calves going berserk from the other part of the barn. Something they usually do when someone walks through, or if they hear some sort of noise. Now, I admittedly was a bit spooked out. I exited the parlor, and I went to go and investigate the situation. I was now in the milk house where there's four huge milk tanks, as well as three sinks. I walked into this area, and I saw a figure peering behind tank number three, and me, being the stupid 15-year-old I was, decided to confront this person. I took a few steps closer, and then said, Hey, who's back there? The figure peeked out again, and they saw me. They then came out from behind the tank and started to approach me. I took a step back when I then realized the person had a knife and he looked homeless. He had no shoes on, a dirty face, ripped clothes, and looked to be about late 30s, early 40s. He then said, You want to say that again? I suggest you don't. Whoa, man, I don't want any trouble. I said back, trembling. He started to approach me, and I decided to not back away from him and sort of just stand my ground, even though I didn't want to deal with this person altogether. He held the knife towards me like he was going to stab me with it. What about now? Scared yet? The homeless man said. Dude, get the fuck out of here before I call the police. I yelled at the man. He froze, looked at me, and then walked out the door. I honestly thought that was the end of it. I went back into the parlor quite shaken up, but there was still a job to be done, so I finished it. Later on when the milking was all done, it must have been about 7pm or so. I walked out of the parlor, turned the lights off, and started to walk out of the milk house after turning on the tank cooler. I walked out of the door and I then froze when I saw a square piece of paper right on the windshield of my car, as well as several knife scratches on the hood, along with the knife itself laying on the gravel. I immediately called the police. While I was waiting for them to come out here in the middle of nowhere, I looked at the tank cooler, and it was shut off. I could have sworn that I just turned it on. I didn't have enough time to turn it back on, as I then saw the blue and red lights pull into the barn. I walked out, not even bothering to turn on the cooler again. Then I explained everything that happened that night with the police, and I told them that I thought the man was still on the property. The officer was very interested in my story, and asked plenty of questions. I asked him if he could go search the property and find the man. He agreed, and he started walking. After about 15 minutes into searching the whole barn, he found the man in the power room, where all of the electricity on the whole farm is controlled from. The man gave me the most evil look that I will never forget, which still haunts me to this day. The police took the knife in for evidence, along with the paper on the windshield, which actually read, I fucking hate you for being such a bitch. I'm going to kill you. Yeah, this still really haunts me. It's been almost a decade later since this all happened, and the man is in prison for having sex with a minor. Yeah, I think that I really dodged a bullet that day. The story takes place during the summer of 2020 in Houston, Texas. We reside in a southern state, and most of the states on our road trip had lifted the lockdowns at this point. We had driven from Florida to Texas and back. This was a business trip for my husband, and we had tagged along to do some sightseeing while he worked during some of the day hours. Tuesday, August 4th was one of those days myself and our then six-year-old daughter had ventured out to the local Galleria Mall. Upon entering the store around 10.30 to 11 a.m., we were greeted by a female sales clerk at the front. She was very warm and personable, and upon mentioning that we were here to do some back-to-school shopping, she mentioned that she was a French teacher at a school in the area. She was asking if we were going back to school in person, and other COVID-related school questions. At this point, my daughter was a bit squirrely, and she started to run off. 
I politely excused myself just to make sure she didn't run off too far. As we made our way throughout the store, I did notice a male of medium build close by. He was probably no older than his early 30s and he had a red t-shirt on, black athletic shorts, tennis shoes, and a ball cap with dark curly hair sticking out. I couldn't make out his ethnicity due to not being able to see his face through his mask, but he was either really tan or just darker complected. As the minutes went on, something immediately didn't feel right to me at all. We had been in mostly women and children product aisles, and he was always just nearby, holding no items in his hands, nor did he have any type of cart with him. The absolute blood-boiling breaking point for me was when he walked in opposite direction at one point past us, and I flat out turned my head towards him to give him the evil eye, and I saw that he had his eyes directly on my daughter, almost like he was checking her out like he should be looking at women his own age. I've always heard about people with black soulless eyes, but I truly saw evil in his that day. I picked up the pace, heading towards aisles with more people in them. My daughter was too tall to be carried by me, and she was very confused why I was putting her back to my torso and legs, pushing her along as fast as we could move. He knew that this time was to make his move, and he started power walking towards us at high speed and getting very close. I immediately hooked my forearms under my daughter's underarms, and I flung her out of his way, putting my back to him. He then literally ran out of the store as I then yelled and pointed at him, shouting some very choice vocabulary, pedophile being one for sure. At least this did attract the attention of the customers and staff. You best believe I told them what happened and that they would be wise to check their cameras as well as the outdoor cameras to see if he hopped into a vehicle most likely driven by someone else. These traffickers work in teams. They always do. We waited some minutes, and a manager had walked us out to my car, making sure that no one was hanging around or parked next to us. Needless to say, this put a damper on the day, and our mom and daughter shopping trip was cut short. Reflecting back on this incident, as well as really looking into the problem of child trafficking in the years since, there are sadly many moving parts to these operations, starting with the woman up front. Did she even work there? Was she paid to distract families so that the predator can enter the store unnoticed? Obviously, the mask policy at the time could easily make anyone unidentifiable, including the children taken. The Galleria Mall was at the time in a very high-end and wealthy area of Houston, and the store was Naaman Marcus' last call. Crime truly has no address or income restrictions. Nothing like this has happened to us prior, and nothing since. Usually dad is with us on these types of trips. He's a pretty intimidating looking Viking, and these absolute cowards would never approach with such a man and father present. And if we immediately decided to exit the store, remember, these people work in teams. There's almost always a getaway car with another driver, and they would just shove either my daughter or the both of us into the car, then take off. The wisest thing to do is create a scene and be around others who would stop or help me block the predator on their way out. Just by being aware of our surroundings, we can also be aware of people around us and noting their movements. The man following us was clearly in aisles with which he had no business. He really stuck out like a sore thumb, and thankfully my already strong intuition has become even more spot on, which I'm very thankful for. The story took place during the summer of 2016. At the time, I was going into my sophomore year in college, and I was dating a girl who at the time was going into her senior year in high school. One of my friends, for the sake of this story, we'll call him Daniel, was throwing a birthday slash going back to school party at his new place. At first, I was really excited, as this would be the first party my girlfriend and I would be attending together, and I thought this would be a fun way to cap off what had been a really good summer. Now, before I go any further, I should clarify something about my good friend Daniel. We had known each other since grade school, and we grew up down the street from one another. I knew him very well until around college when we drifted apart. 
Daniel dropped in and out of college and didn't talk to me much, so I did find it a little surprising when he invited me to his party. Anyway, the night of the party comes, and I pick up my girlfriend, and we make our way to Daniel's house. The drive took a little over an hour, and since I had dropped the ball and forgot to request work off the next morning, it meant that I would be driving home that night, meaning I wasn't going to drink much, if anything, at the party. By the time we showed up, I would say that the party was well underway. My girlfriend and I decided that we would stay there until around 12.30 a.m. before we would want to head out. Some time goes past, and I look at my phone, seeing that it's a little after 11 p.m. At the same time, my girlfriend nudged me, and she said she wasn't feeling well. I asked her what she had to drink, to which she responded nothing, and that the feeling she had was the one that a person gets whenever they think something bad's about to happen. I chuckled a bit when she said this, and I tossed it to being in an unfamiliar place and just not knowing anyone, while obviously being looked at as one of the youngest people at the party. By this point in the night, there had to be at least 60 people or so at the party, and as for as small of a place as it was, it felt like sardines in a can. I suggested to my girlfriend that we take a step outside and get some fresh air, and that maybe she would begin to feel better. She agreed, and we decided to head to the backyard and talk for a little, without having to battle all the noise from the party inside. About five minutes go by, and while we're standing outside, the slight noise from the house goes eerily silent. I try to look through the windows to see if a fight or something else broke out, when out of nowhere, my girlfriend grabs my arm, and she sees that someone inside the party is wielding a gun. I turn my head slightly towards the right, and sure enough, I see what she does, but even more. I quickly realize that the person holding the weapon is not just anybody at the party, but it was Daniel. Stuck in a moment of shock, my girlfriend quickly breaks the silence that surrounded my head, asking what we should do. I tell her that we need to get away from the house and call 911, which she nods in agreement. Very quietly, we snuck out of the backyard and called 911 without issue. In the midst of the call, however, I had heard two gunshots back to back, and then chaos totally erupts. By the time police arrived, the party had scattered, leaving just my girlfriend and I to answer most of the questions considering that we were the only ones sober to actually do so. We were not allowed back into the house that night, and once the police had the information from us that they wanted, they let us leave. A couple of weeks pass before the police reached out to me again to thank my girlfriend and I for helping their investigation. Out of curiosity, I asked what the investigation yielded, and well, the officer told me the story. After reading through Mr. Daniel's personal journals, it became evident to us that the party was a way to enact revenge on his ex-girlfriend. A young man who was at the party that night apparently had no idea that he was invited simply because he was talking to Mr. Daniel's ex-girlfriend. As the party went on, Mr. Daniel showed a 22 caliber pistol, that of which belonged to his father, and he threatened to kill the young man if he continued to talk with Mr. Daniel's ex. Another young man was at the party, and he also revealed a concealed weapon right at that moment, and he instructed Mr. Daniel to back down. Mr. Daniel continued to push when the young man fired two shots, both striking Mr. Daniel in the leg. Once the police arrived on scene, Mr. Daniel was taken for treatment of his gunshot wounds, and the young man who fired the shots was detained for a short while. I asked the officer what would happen to Daniel or the other man, but the officer just told me that the case was still ongoing and that he couldn't make any further comments at that moment. A couple of months passed, and Daniel was charged with aggravated attempted assault with a deadly weapon, and the other man had no charges brought against him, but they did have a civil case for shooting Daniel that was later dropped. I share this story to remind you that the craziest things can happen anywhere and with anyone, even if you've known them since childhood, anyone can surprise you. Hey everyone, I hope you all enjoyed these stories. If you ever want to submit your own, 
you can do so at southerncannibal.com. Have a good night, everyone. And remember, to always stay.